Okay guys, so we're talking about acute kidney injury today. Really quickly, um, some of the risk diagnoses that, diagnoses <laughs> that can cause an acute kidney injury are um, if you've had recent surgery, and we're talking within the last few days um, to a week, recent trauma, I'm not talking about emotional trauma, uh, psychological trauma, whatever. Um, we're talking about actual, you were a trauma patient um, so you had, you qualified for trauma criteria and then sepsis or SIR and or SIRS, sorry. Um, and then our diabetes, mellitus patients, and then hypertension. So those are kind of our medical diagnoses or chronic illnesses that can predispose us to an acute kidney injury. And, um, so today's lesson is not about chronic kidney disease at all. That's a totally separate animal. Today we're talking about an acute kidney injury that comes on, um, uh, suddenly. Okay, so meds to stop. These are not nephrotoxic meds, these, these uh, meds in red. They're not classified as nephrotoxic. However, since they are excreted by the kidney, uh, we should stop them until the kidney is better, right? Until the acute kidney injury is either resolved or uh, something's figured out. So NSAIDs are a big one. Metformin, we already figured that out because metformin you can't take when you're doing IV contrast. Uh, gabapentin, ACEs and ARBs, and then opiates, namely morphine, but most opiates, okay. Um, and then, oh sorry, morphine's going to go down there. And then cefepime is one of the big uh, cephalosporins that, that uh, can um, exaggerate that. Okay, now our nephrotoxic medications that cause, that can cause or induce a kidney injury so the big ones and the most common ones are the immunoglycoside antibiotics. So those are all of the mycins. So vancomycin, gentamicin, erythromycin, clarithromycin, and clindamycin. So all of those. And again, we're talking about IV medications, okay? So those are gonna be more often what's gonna cause an acute kidney injury. I'm sure the POs can cause it, but, but more risk with um, IV. Amphotericin, um, otherwise known as amphoterable. That's the IV antifungal medication. And so um, that's the one uh, not used a ton, um, but mostly in the hospital with uh, severe patients. So, and then our chemotherapy patients, so, uh, but chemotherapy kind of messes with everything. Okay, now acute kidney injury is defined by a few criteria. So the first thing is the creatinine. So if the creatinine is increased, um, by 1.5 points above the patient's baseline, then it's considered uh, an acute kidney injury, along with urinary output and the presence of protein. So um, that above the patient, patient baseline, so let's pretend that we have a patient with a baseline creatinine of one. Okay, so you have to know their creatinine before their elevation. So before their creatinine was elevated, we need to know what it was before. So hence the baseline number. Obviously, if they come in through the ER, you may or may not have a baseline creatinine. It just kind of depends. All right, so let's pretend that their baseline creatinine is one, just to make the math easy. That means that once that creatinine hits 2.5 or above, that means that that now is considered an acute kidney injury by the creatinine criteria. Okay, now if their urine output drops below 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour, okay, for a six hour time, six hour time period, um, then that qualifies them as an acute uh, kidney injury as well. So if you just um, basically take, we want urine output to be a, a minimum of one mil per kg per hour, and that's for adults. So that's what we want to have. Um, now let's pretend we have a 150 pound patient. That would be roughly this half a milliliter per hour would be roughly 34 mils in an hour. So anything less than that is going to be uh, pretty severe as far as the acute kidney injury. So that 30 mils that we say 30 mils is an hour, an hour is actually less than what a 150 pound patient would need in order to make that half a mil per kg per hour. So if they're 30 mils in an hour and they're a 200 pound patient, they're way below that half a mil mark. Um, so you'll have to do their weight to figure out, uh, convert them into kilograms and multiply it 
uh, by 0.5, figure out what their minimum urinary output should be. Okay, and then albuminuria, so the presence of protein in the urine, and the presence of sediment or casts. So the sediment in the cast is uh, a buildup of protein, also um, uh, red blood cells as well, because the kidneys aren't able to process anything, they're not working, and so then they're flushing out tons of protein, and then those kind of collect up um, in the urine. All right, kidney injury signs and symptoms. So they're gonna be, they're gonna have edema, fluid overload symptoms. This might happen later, okay? And then they might be hypotensive or hypertensive, okay, depending on where they're at in their fluid status. And then they're going to have signs and symptoms of uh, hyperkalemia, okay, um, possibly. That's going to be something you're going to need to monitor and look for, okay. Um, so the number one risk, like we're saying, for an acute kidney injury, the thing that's going to kill them the quickest. So the fluid overload, um, the low output, that's going to kill them for sure. But the high potassium will kill them in hours if you don't fix it. Okay. So um, we start treating hyperkalemia with medications once it hits 5.5. So 3.5 to 5 is considered normal in most laboratories, uh, most hospitals. So once it hits that 5.5 mark, we start um, treating it medically. All right, some of the signs and symptoms, they're going to have decreased reflexes uh, response. So their deep tendon reflexes are going to be decreased. That's not really something you're going to do necessarily in the hospital. Um, you can, uh, but all of these other symptoms are going to be a little bit more telltale. So um, their LOC is going to be changed. They're going to be more irritable. They're going to have muscle cramps, paresthesia, so tingling, abdominal cramping, diarrhea, decrease in energy, um, chest pain. And then that's when you have to say, uh-oh, because once you get to the chest pain phase, that means that their potassium is probably pretty high. Um, this leads to arrhythmias if you don't take care of that high potassium. So if you remember back from Megacode week, uh, what was one of our causes of pulseless cardiac arrest? Remember how we had to think about the causes of pulseless cardiac arrest? And they all start with H or T. Well, guess what? Here's one of the H's, hyperkalemia, okay? So now we've completed the circuit, we've gone all the way around the horn, and we've connected Megacode over to hyperkalemia, because hyperkalemia eventually will cause pulseless cardiac arrest. Um, uh, the treatment of hyperkalemia, and so a lot of times this is initiated in the ER, but it can be done uh, almost anywhere. So once you find out that your patient has high potassium, we have to do some stuff to fix it. Um, so we have to give IV push D50, okay? And let's see, it's in a 50 mil syringe and it is, sorry, I have to fix this. It is 25 grams, because I was incorrect. <laughs> I know, I was incorrect, I don't know everything. So um, it's 25 grams in 50 mils and Yeah, so it's 25 grams in 50 mils. A half an amp is considered 12.5 grams, and then D50 of D50, okay? So that is uh, 25 mils, yeah, sorry. So 50 mils is 25 grams, and then 25 mils is gonna be 12 and a half grams. All right, so that is to pre-medicate them because we're about to give them a downer in the form of insulin. So we're going to give them a little bit of a diabetic speedball, if you excuse the, the phrase, because we're giving them the sugar to bring them up, because we're about to hit them hard with insulin to bring them bring the sugar down. So remember the side effect from last week of insulin is hypokalemia. We lose potassium into the cell out of the serum. Well, guess what? That's what we want. We've got high potassium, so let's give them some insulin. Well, we can't just drop their blood sugar because now we're trying to fix the potassium, but now we also have the blood sugar issue too. So we have to give them a little bit of sugar in their IV to help them so that we don't crash them. So you're gonna to wanna to give them sugar first before insulin, make sure you do that. Um, and then because insulin is gonna bring glucose into the cell along with the potassium, so we pre-medicate with the glucose. You can't push it fast even if you wanted to. It's a big syringe. 
Um, it's usually pre-made. EMS uh, carries them around because they give them a lot to their hypoglycemic patients. All right, so we give this regular, and this is IV, okay? We're not giving this PO. It's not gonna work if you give it PO. It won't work as fast. So, we, and then we give them regular insulin IV push. It's usually 10 units um, IV push for adults, and that's regular Humulin or Novelin, whichever your department carries. And then why? Well, because we're bringing the potassium from the serum back into the cell. If you remember from last week, Mr. Cell and Mr. Serum, before insulin, we got lots of potassium in the serum. Cool. Well, if we give them insulin, we're going to get rid of the potassium and pull it into the cell. Not really get rid of it, but we're going to pull it into the cell and get it out of the serum. If it's in the serum, it causes more trouble for the heart. Okay. So calcium gluconate is not given. So it is not given to decrease potassium. That's not its job. It's given to kind of give a little pillow cushion around the heart, if you will. We're trying to protect the heart from the really high uh, cardiotoxicity of potassium. So it's been found that if you have a lower calcium, kind of on the low end of normal, then that increases the cardiotoxic effect of the potassium even more. So we want to give them some calcium so that they are able to kind of protect the heart a little bit from all of that potassium. So uh, usually we give it in, it's measured in milliequivalents. And it's usually given IV drip nowadays. Um, back in the day, we used to give it IV push. Some places might still do it that way. Um, but a lot of times, pharmacy sends it to you in a little um, 50 to 100 ml bag, and you give it over 30 minutes. Um, okay, now caxalate is going to lower potassium. But get ready, <laughs> because it's usually 30 to 60 milliliters, or they might measure it in grams. You can give it by mouth, or you can give it up the butt. But if you're going to give it up the butt, then you need the cath tip syringe. You can't use a lure lock syringe because that lure lock syringe doesn't go in the bottom. That only goes in the IV. So you got to use the big long cath tip syringe so you can stick it up the rear end. Um, so it causes explosive diarrhea, and I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating at all. It's pretty explosive. Once you give it, you literally can set a, a timer or a clock to them, and it'll probably be within 10 minutes that they'll have some pretty good diarrhea. Why is this? Well, it pulls a lot of the potassium, not all of it, but it pulls a bunch of the potassium into the gut, and that high amount of potassium in the gut in that short amount of time causes lots and lots of water to enter the gut because you change that osmotic gradient. So it's basically kind of the, the same concept as an enema, right? So we give... Um, you know, whatever enema, your soap suds or whatever, well, guess what's in there? There's tons of soap, lots and lots of ions, okay? This just happens to be a potassium enema, if you will. So we give them k pulls the potassium into the gut, water follows the potassium, and then, boop, you have lots and lots of explosive diarrhea, which lowers our potassium even more. Great. So it comes out with the poop. Awesome. The potassium comes out with the poop. You gotta be ready for this. And so this is the big joke between ER and ICU. How do you piss off your ICU nurse people? Well, you give, <laughs> you give your patient, your hyperkalemic patient, k in the elevator. Um, I have done this before, but in my defense, um, I did go with them to the ICU and then I helped clean them up. So I helped with the initial uh, k uh, diarrhea afterwards. Okay, and then with these folks, we're also going to be giving them some isotonic fluids. That depends on their fluid status. So if they're in fluid overload, then obviously we're not going to be doing that so much. We possibly are going to be giving them Lasix, depending on their fluid status as well. And um, that's more to draw off the fluid if they're in fluid overload. But it does decrease potassium, but there again, we can't pee it out as well until we fix that kidney injury. Um, the And then possibly the diet they're going to go to dialysis if their potassium is too high what's too high well usually once they hit in the mid sixes but probably around 6.3 they're starting to think about dialysis um, it might be different for different facilities and different departments but that's kind of usually where they're like oh yeah we need to they'll get all these these meds into them and then they'll they'll uh, send them to dialysis as well okay now Hyperkalemia changes to your EKG. See, this is what this is essentially what kills you with hyperkalemia and why it's so dangerous. So you have the peak T waves, okay? 
And these little peak T waves will actually look like another QRS. They might be as high as the QRS in amplitude, or they might be even higher than the QRS. It just depends on what your amplitude is set at on your monitor. Um, and you can see this just on a three lead or even a five lead. And so then you're gonna wanna get a 12 lead to get a better look um, and see what things are doing. So you can kind of get a bigger picture um, and see the rest of the abnormalities. So then you're gonna see progressive PR lengthening. And again, this is when our potassium, these things happen as the potassium is getting higher and higher and if the potassium goes unchanged or unfixed. All right, and then, so our PR interval is going to get longer, okay? And then the QRS uh, shortens up, okay? So then the QRS is going to kind of shorten. Then the P wave disappears. Bye. Bye, P wave. No more P wave. Bye-bye. And then the QRS widens. Okay, and then eventually we get a bundle branch block and get ready for this because then they're going to go into VTAC or VFib. So they're going to be dead as a doornail. Um, and I have only seen get to this point. I've not seen, um, I've not seen it where they get past that point. Usually, uh, I, I've never seen a potassium super high where they're already kind of in the pre-VTAC arrhythmia bundle branch block phase. Okay. And that is the end of the video.